Welcome to Heart to Heart Nurses, brought to you by the Preventive Cardiovascular Nurses Association. PCNA's mission is to promote nurses as leaders in cardiovascular disease prevention and management. I'd like to welcome our listeners to this episode of Heart to Heart Nurses, where we're going to learn how to help our patients with CBD and cancer navigate their complex health issues. First, I'd like to have our guests introduce themselves. We are so honored to have Janet Selly and Carrie Skirka with us today. Janet, could you introduce yourself first, and then we'll ask Carrie to do the same. Yes, thank you, Geraldine, for having us today. I um, am a cardiology oncology nurse at Advent Health in Orlando. Um, I have been blessed to do this job since 2019. My career from 1986 to now, I had spent the first couple of years in oncology and the subsequent years in cardiology. So this blends both of those specialties in adult um, medicine together and has helped us to be proactive with our patients instead of reactive with trying to help patients with cardiovascular disease. Hi, my name is Carrie Skirka, and I am a cardio-oncology nurse. Um, My story is uh, pretty much like Janet's in that I was a cardiac nurse for many, many years in uh, lots of different fields of cardiology and then uh, went to the field of oncology. And in 2016, I became a cardio-oncology nurse navigator And uh, I'm uh, so excited about being able to blend these two fields and help patients down the road uh, through this, um, this trying time. Thank you both so very much. For listeners who listened to our previous episode, and if you haven't yet, it's a great place to start, we discussed the field of cardio oncology and the links between cardiovascular disease and oncology. So in this episode, I'm hoping we can learn a little bit more about how to help our patients face these incredibly challenging and incredibly complex health issues. Janet, can you please start us off? Yes. So um, hopefully, if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to the first podcast, you, you'll you find some time to do that. But as you may already know, anthracyclines have been around since the 1960s, adriamycin being a key one that is utilized in the treatment of uh, leukemias and some of the GI cancers and breast cancers. And anthracyclines have been quite successful with actually helping as a cancer treatment. In the late 1980s and the early 1990s, we started to see some cancer survivors that had actually um, gone into remission have cardiology symptomatology. So cardiologists were scratching their head at that time, trying to say, why, why is this person coming into my clinic with congestive heart failure or needing perhaps an ICD or something like that in their early 40s when they had breast cancer earlier on. And that's when we actually started to develop the actual subspecialty of cardio-oncology. Some of the chemotherapy agents we now know, such as adriamycin, can put people at a higher risk or moderate risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, especially if it's if they are utilized in higher doses, such as 450 milligrams per meter square, that's considered a higher range of that uh, adriamycin. We also know that when combined with HER2 therapies, such as Herceptin and Progetta, these uh, anthracyclines actually utilized with the Herceptin and Progetta have a synergistic effect and can put people in a higher risk category for cardiovascular disease just by utilizing those two methodologies for their, for their cancer treatment. So our goal is to review, really to look at the patient's uh, core morbidities as we start them in their oncology journey, um, you know, for treating the actual cancers and we want to make sure that we're reviewing all of their history and comorbidities and then making sure that we do preventatively monitor them so that they don't have cardiovascular disease as a result of successfully completing their cancer treatments. And Carrie, if I may, um, would you like to review some of the actual comorbidities that patients um, might have that we would look at? Thanks, Janet. That, uh, that is one of the things that we've found out as we've gone further into uh, cardio-oncology is that the comorbidities for both cancer and cardiovascular disease overlap significantly. And um, so just to mention some of them, um, I would say that diabetes uh, is one that um, uh, could lend you to both, as well as hypertension, 
hyperlipidemia, um, smoking, of course, uh, can cause cancer and also cardiovascular disease. I think uh, we've talked about that uh, a lot. And um, in our lifetimes, trying to get people to quit smoking. And, um, and that includes vaping. So uh, there's new research that shows that vaping uh, can is not as helpful as we initially had hoped that maybe it could be. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, uh, obesity is an independent uh, predictor uh, comorbidity of both cancer and cardiovascular disease, um, as well as a sedentary lifestyle. And I think, you know, as we look at um, these comorbidities, um, trying to help people uh, mitigate those um, comorbidities by managing them is something that the cardio uh, cardio oncology team helps with. Um, the best thing that ha- can happen for a patient is that they are presented to a cardio oncologist and his or her team, whoever it may be, to help look at where are they if they have any of these comorbidities and make sure we are addressing those comorbidities on the front side uh, before they start their treatment um, so that we can um, help them um, have a more successful um, treatment course, as well as um, a lot of times, uh, as um, Janet mentioned, what we will do is surveillance testing. We'll look at um, cardiovascular screening tools such as echoes or EKGs or biomarkers um, or uh, looking at their lipids, uh, their blood sugars, all of those things are very helpful and help the cardio-oncologist get the patient so that they're in the best condition to move forward in their cardiovascular disease um, treatment as they go through their cancer journey. There's a lot of things that you can do um, to help a patient um, with um, those comorbidities and um, I think uh, managing your blood pressure is probably one that people can do a lot to help with that. Um, And learning how to manage your blood pressure is a challenge because sometimes uh, it's something you you can um, have because of other comorbidities or it can be uh, uh, inherited things. Sometimes it doesn't matter um, that you do the best, you just have bad genes. And that is not anybody's fault. That's just that your, your, your parents, um, gave that to you. Right, Janet? Yes, exactly right. And you can't do much about that. But if you have the knowledge that you uh, have hypertension or a genetic predisposition, you can definitely try to ward off, uh, extended visits to the hospital by just taking care of, uh, yourself and, and being involved in wellness for sure. We've been talking with Kelly Skirka and Janet Selly about cardio-oncology factors that include lifestyle modification, things like exercise and hypertension and controllable risk factors, as well as the things that we have inherited from our parents for good or for bad. We will be right back. For more education, resources, and tools for your clinical practice, visit PCNA.net. You'll find CE courses, patient handouts, and more, all free to access. Visit PCNA.net. And we're back discussing cardio-oncology, and we are happy to have with us Carrie Skirka and Janet Selly to give us some more detailed information about one of the things that worries many of us, keeps us up at night perhaps, and that is the idea of health equity. It's one of the key considerations for healthcare providers and really impacts patients across the spectrum, including those with cardiology issues and those with oncology issues. So I'm hoping that our team might be able to describe how health equity can affect treatment for patients with cancer and with CVD. Janet, could you get us started? Yes, thank you, um, Geraldine. It it is a struggle because, as we as we may know, uh, academic programs and community programs can be extremely different. Academia, we are um, blessed for because this is where we benchmark a lot of our care. Um, but that that actually accounts for 
academic programs account for just a little over 6% of all cancer patients that we we treat. Most cancer patients are going to be treated in a community setting. Um, and although we're grateful for the research and the advancements in medicine that are derived from uh, the academic centers, we have to really um, be aware that the majority of the patients are going to be treated in a community center. And many of our patients are underinsured or not insured at all. So we've been thankful for the support uh, in my Advent Health setting for patient financial services. We utilize case managers and our foundation uh, quite a bit. So we've been blessed to try to assist patients that are uh, either underinsured or uh, self-pay because we really want to make sure that we realize there's a, a lot um, is involved in the Black, Hispanic, Asian populations in our society um, have a higher difficulty with cardiovascular disease, um, and that's all research-based. So knowing that, we want to be able to help everyone across the board and really focus on making sure that we give everybody the very best of care that we possibly can and not have um, the actual health um, be be affected by the fact that patients may not have insurance or or be underinsured. So we, we do work quite a bit with patient financial services, case management, um, and a lot of a lot of different supports. And I, I do know, Carrie, you had mentioned um, some other resources um, that can provide pa- patient advocacy for financial assistance um, or nonprofits. Yes, actually, there are a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, just like Janet uh, mentioned, I mentioned before, um, you know, um, your uh, parents, um, you know, who they are, you don't have control over your genes. And of course, unfortunately, Hispanics, uh, Blacks, and also Asians um, tend to have um, a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. And so, um, and, you know, it is important, therefore, to focus on uh, those things as they go through um, their cancer treatment. And there are lots of resources out there that people can use. Um, There are, you can go to actually your own cancer center and talk with, um, they have a patient advocacy in the financial counselors there. They're really great about finding avenues for support. Um, one of the other ones is the foundations within your institution can also help you with support financially. Um, and, um, then there is one that people don't think about is the pharmaceutical companies. Um, they all have uh, supports to get treatments to patients that don't have the financial needs. And uh, that's really important to know. And as Janet mentioned, you know, most of the care is being done in the community setting. And um, but all the science is in the academic setting. Um, And I, I say that is the most up and coming trials and research are available there. But one thing that you can do is go to a second opinion clinic. A second opinion clinic is where um, you may be in a community center and all you have to do is make an appointment with an academic center at their second opinion clinic. And they can therefore see you there, make uh, make recommendations for treatment, and then you can be treated uh, with that in your community setting, which really takes a large burden off of the patients. Um, because there is where all their other providers are. Uh, that's where their support systems are. And that uh, tends to be a challenge for um, the patients. A couple others that I can think of is um, the Little Red Door. And as I mentioned once before, uh, the cancer support community, um, those can also be avenues to help you with um, any uh, resources that you might need to move through your cancer journey. This has been such a rich conversation. We have covered some of the side effects of cardio-oncology and the cardiovascular impacts. We've talked about access to care and health equity issues. And we've been talking with Janet Selly and Carrie Skirka about how to help our patients uh, access care and actually manage these complex diseases. In our next episode, we'll be looking at the importance of and the best strategies for success in team-based care for patients with CBD and cancer. 
We are grateful to you for your time to be a listener of the Heart to Heart Nurses podcast. This is your host, Geraldine Warfield, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Heart to Heart Nurses. We invite you to visit pcna.net for clinical resources, continuing education, and much more.